Thank you. Thanks for the thank you for the invitation. It's great, my great pleasure to speak here. And today I will be introducing uh, work from my two two projects that are joined with uh, Victoria Cantaro Fafan, Elena Mantoven, Rachel Price, and Yun Qingtang. Even though there are two projects, but it really started the same problem from two different aspects. So let's start from um, from the concept of ordinary and the super singular elliptic curves. Let's go back to our first graduate course on elliptic curves. We were looking at an elliptic curve defined over a finite field, FQ, right? We, we can even like, when, when we think about the characteristic not two or three, we can even very concretely just write the, just represent the elliptic curve with a short Weierstrass equation given by y squared equals to x cubed plus ax plus b, where a, b, the coefficients are in the finite field FQ. Then we can count the number of FQ points, and this number is given by one plus Q minus a integer a, and this a is called the trace of Frobenius. Um, it's the trace of Frobenius action on the elliptic tape module of the curve. And then we learned a concept, a uh, thing that we learned a concept that's called super singular, which is a phenomena that only happens in this positive characteristic case. So the elliptic curve is called super singular if the characteristic p divides this trace of Frobenius and it's ordinary if p does not divide a. So then in the case of because of the Hassel bond, we know that this a is bounded between, um, it's bounded, the absolute value of a is bounded by twice square root of q. So in this case, we know that, well, if, if the curve is defined over a prime field at p with p greater than two, then this divisibility and the Hassel bond together tells you that this elliptic curve is only super singular if and only if this trace is equal to zero. So meaning that it exactly has one plus t many points. And then we also learned that if the curve is super singular, then it bears many special properties. For example, it has a much bigger endomorphism algebra. And then it, it behaves uh, also like now we know that it's the number of FQ points is given by this special value. It has all kinds of special properties. Making, making it a very interesting topic of study. And but on the other hand, then the question, the essential question of today is how many, how many of them are super singular versus how many of them are ordinary? So since super singular, as I said, have all these very, uh, very special properties, it, is, it is, makes sense that to, to us to expect that maybe there are less of them, right? Um, they are really like some, some, uh, some sort of special points. Um, so, well, one way, to, one way to think about how many elliptic curves are super singular versus ordinary, we need to put elliptic curves in a family. So the first way to, the first perspective I'll take is if I consider all the elliptic curves over FP bar and vary my parameter AB really just in FP bar, and then, then we get, then we can ask the number of isomorphism classes of super singular elliptic curve versus ordinary elliptic curve, right? And we know that over algebraically closed field, if the curves are parameterized by J invariant, right? I can literally just, then how many, I, if I want to parameterize isomorphism classes of the curves over algebraically closed field, I just need to pick a J invariant in, in, in FP bar, right? So, so there are infinitely many of them. So um, then in, the, in this case, we see that there are only finitely many, among all these infinitely many J invariants in FP bar, only finitely of them give you a super singular elliptic curve. And we actually know that, um, the number of isomorphism classes uh, over p bar is roughly it's roughly p over twelve, so it's basically linear in p, and this is this is one way that we, we feel that there are less super singular super singular is like a rare phenomena because because over the whole modular curve or p bar, there is a open dense locus of elliptic curves which are ordinary and there are only a finite many sets finite sets of them are super singular. Okay, so this is one way to think, to ask the question, how many of the curves are super singular, how many of them are ordinary, right? By literally parameterizing all of the curves over P bar. There is another very natural perspective. Namely, I can also take a elliptic curve over a global field and then vary the set of primes in this global field, consider the reduction of the elliptic curve at these primes and ask that at how many primes my reduction are ordinary and how many primes are reduction are super singular. So this is really a varying characteristic kind of phenomenon if you are taking the global field to be a number field, which is a perspective we are taking today. Okay, so 
let's fix the curve E defined over a number field L. Then I can consider the set of primes. I'll call them Q in L in the sense like you can think about FQ as the residue field for this prime that lies above P, a rational prime P, which is a characteristic of your residue field. And let's consider the places where E has good reduction, which is just all but fancy many places of L. Then, um, then when, I, when I take the reduction, I get into curve over the residue field, which is a finite field. Then we can use the definition of ordinary and super singular. Um, we will say that E has ordinary reduction or at Q if, if the reduction is literally ordinary Lipschitz curve or the residue field. And I'll also refer to Q as the ordinary prime for E. Same thing for super singular. Then when I vary this set of primes, again, it's a very natural question to ask that what's the density of the ordinary versus super singular primes? If I take one elliptic curve or a global field, any elliptic curve, right? And I consider all the primes of this, um, of this number field and consider the reduction, how many of them will give me a super singular reduction versus ordinary reduction? Well, let me first tell you one case where we have a complete answer. By a complete answer, I mean, not only we know the density, Will, if you give me a prime, I literally can tell you whether the reduction is ordinary or super singular. That's the case when the Lipschitz curve, global Lipschitz curve, has complex multiplication. Okay, so by the work of Shimura Tanyama, if I have a Lipschitz curve E defined over a number field L, and it has CM by an order in, in a quadrat imaginary quadratic field, Q a joint squared minus D, okay? So I have already draw, drawn the field here. So my Lipschitz curve E is defined over L, right? If I have a prime Q, that's the prime in L, that lies above the rational prime P, and I want to ask what kind of reduction, let's assume that, that the Q is a good a prime of good reduction for E, then I want to ask whether my reduction is ordinary or super singular. All I need to do is to look at the behavior P in this qu imaginary quadratic extension, Q to Q joint squared minus D. Okay, so what happens is that, is that um, P, so P splits in this, in this quad, quadratic extension if and only if E, um, e reduction, I'll say mod P, re, reduce at P is ordinary. Okay. So this tells me that the, um, so this tells me that whether, whether the Lipschitz curve has a, um, has a ordinary or super single reduction at, at this prime Q in L is just given by a Legendre symbol, which is just minus D over P. And if you think about D as a, let's take D as a prime or something by quadratic reciprocity, it really gives me a congruence condition, right? In terms of P. So all I need to care about essentially, roughly, is just the congruence condition of P mod D. Okay. So this tells us that in this case, as I said, it's the complete answer. Not only I know the density of ordinary primes, I also know um, I also know exactly which primes I have ordinary versus super singular reduction, right? Here, since the congruence condition, um, so we know that we know that um, the for uh, yeah, uh, so so we can ex explicitly write out the density, okay, by chapter of density theorem. Okay, great. So then, how about the non CM case, which is a more generic behavior for elliptic curve defined over L, right? Okay. So then it is a, it is a theorem of Sayer saying that for any P curve E defined over a number field L, its set of ordinary primes always have density one or one half. So one half case, so you really should think about this as ordinary prime has density one because the one half case only comes from the, 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 the CM picture that we had. So imagine your, basically the point is if your base field was Q, if the curve was defined over Q, right? Then you should think that half of the primes Split in this quadratic extension, and the half the prime uh, is inert in this in this extension. So I get a, get a half. And also, you can see that if I base change, if I, if my base field contains square to minus d, then when I count primes by norm, I only see the split primes. So really, uh, so 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 really, we, you should think about it as if you have a little bit curve e defined over a global number field L, roughly the set of ordinary primes has density one. Okay, so, so this is one side of the question is, that the, so now we know when, when we ask how many primes give me order reduction versus super single reduction, right? Now we know that a density one set of primes, especially for a non-CM curve, a density one set of primes give me order reduction. Then it's also natural to ask how about the super singular? How many primes give me super singular reduction? What's the complementary set, right? 
Um, well, so in the if you think about the module I picture in the first slide, when we think about all the curves defined over FP bar, we know that also almost all the primes um, give are ordinary. Or almost all sorry, almost all the curves defined over FP bar are ordinary, and then the complement set is uh, is finite is a finite set, right? But in, in here, the situation is different. It was uh, it was in Alke's thesis that he proved that for for lots of number field L. Uh, especially uh, uh, one special case is when L admits at least one real embedding, then for any little curve defined over L, there, there are infinitely many primes where the reduction is super singular. So in this reduction perspective, right, you see that you have a density one set where you have all reduction, but then the super singular set turns out to be infinite compared to the over IP bar from the moduli picture where you have an open dense set of gene invariants being ordinary versus fancy many uh, being super singular. Okay, so um, well, the takeaway of this slide is that if you take a non CM little curve, which again the generic is for little curves, um, over or let's just take it for simplicity, let's just take it over base field Q, right? For any non CM little curve E over Q, then at then it has all the reduction at a density one set of primes, and then it has super singular action also have at infinitely many primes. So this is the takeaway of this slide. And then the goal of my talk is to generalize the work of Sarah and Elkis to abelian varieties of higher dimensional abelian varieties. And as one example, I will be talking about the Jacobian of a curve with the following defining equation as y to the fifth equals x times x minus one times x minus t. So take the smooth projective curve with this alpha model. And as you can see that this, this curve has genus four. So we will be starting abelian fourfolds, okay? Okay, so first of all, let me tell you the generalization of Sarah's work in this case. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Before I, before I tell you the, the, the work we did, let me first tell you the generalization of the notion of ordinary and super singular in the higher dimensional abelian variety case to set up the problem, right? Okay, so, well, the generalization of ordinary versus super singular this locus becomes much more complicated when the dimension of your abelian variety gets, gets higher. So let me introduce a notion of Newton polygon. So Newton polygon is a notion that you might have already seen in, in a class of algebraic number theory, where uh, you have a polynomial with integer coefficients, and then you can choose a prime p and, and, and look at the points with, um, and, and draw the points of, um, the, 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 the indices being i, which is the which is the label of the index of the co, uh, of the coefficient, and then also the periodic evaluation of the corresponding coefficient, and then draw the lower convex hull, draw a polygon out of it, and then in algebraic number theory you learned that okay this tells you essentially how this polynomial factors over QP right over the completion, and um, and it, exactly the slope. The slope of this Newton polygon tells you the um, periodic evaluation of the roots of this polynomial. And very often you can use that to prove that your polynomial is uh, irreducible over Q, right? And, um, and that is really the generalization of Eisenstein's criteria, right? Okay, so in here, when we see Newton polygon for an abelian variety, we mean that if I have an abelian variety A defined again over a finite field, then I can again look at the Curtis polynomial for Abelian's um, acting on the dictate module of A and draw the Newton polygon of this of this integral polynomial. So uh, what we do is we will we will we will normalize this polynomial to be uh, to be monic, and also I will index it in the opposite way, meaning that the Curtis polynomial will really be a zero uh, x to the two g plus a one x to the 2g minus one plus that, that, and it is symmetric, right? So the last terms are a1q to the g minus one x plus q to the g, right? Which, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. So it is, it is, so, so, the, so, the, so, so if you look at the coefficients, right? This is my a of 2g, this is my a of 2g minus one, this is symmetric, okay? So we can, we can draw the Newton polygon of this polynomial, and then because we know the leading coefficient is always one, and then the, the constant term is always q to the, q to the g, 
um, what will happen is your Newton polygon will always, all, all the Newton polygons for the Abelian variety with this fixed dimension will have the same starting point and ending point, right? And then you can compare whether two Newton polygons lie above each other or not. And, and, and this whether one lies above each other or not gives the set of Newton polygons with this fixed G a post-set structure. Then it is the work of art uh, saying that this post-set structure turns out to give a stratification of the moduli space, the principally polarized Abelian variety over at P bar, just like the modular curve case we've seen that there are, there are two locuses, right, for AP curve for G equals one. One locus is the ordinary locus, which is open and dense, and then the super singular locus has a co-dimension one, right, it's the stratification. And let's look at another example, which is if I have genus two and I consider A2, consider the um, consider Abelian surfaces over at P bar, then in this case, well, first of all, the dimension of the modular space um, is, is three, right? And uh, I'm not drawing a three-dimensional case, so I'm, I'm drawing the two-dimensional case, but I want to remind you that the dimension of A2 is three. Okay, so what do we mean by stratification? It means that there is an open, dense, three-dimensional locus that is ordinary, okay? And inside this locus, then there is a, a one, uh, there is a co-dimension one, sub locus, which is what we call almost ordinary. It has P rank one. And then inside this almost ordinary locus, there is a co-dimension two uh, sub locus, which are the super singular Abelian surfaces. So this is what we mean by stratification of AG. Okay. And in this case, uh, again, as you can see that uh, as a generalization with the curve case, the, the ordinary locus is always the generic locus for for general for general Abelian variety inside AG, okay, and the Abel and it is ordinary if exactly when half of the Frobenius eigenvalues have p adic value or q adic evaluation zero, and the other half has q adic evaluation one. So it's generalizing the um the so Newton polygon for the curve ordinary curve is have one slope zero and one slope one, and then the Abelian variety being super singular, super singular is always the highest co-dimension locus in AG. And it's super singular if all the Frobenius eigenvalues have q adic evaluation a half. So for the curve case, uh, is it, it, you, you can also say that, uh, say that if that they have both of the Frobenius eigenvalues will have q adic evaluation a half. So we are using q adic evaluation to, to normalize it so that the Newton polygon will be a uh, geometric invariant. So if I enlarge my base field, right, my uh, my Frobenius will raise the power, and by normalizing the, the slope or the, uh, the, uh, the, the eigenvalue won't have the, the evaluation of the eigenvalue will stay the same. Okay, so then as you can, so now this is the notion of ordinary super singular by generalizing, which now allows us to ask a similar question given a higher dimensional Abelian variety defined over a number field. What's the density of the ordinary versus super singular primes when I look at the reduction, just like the curve case, right? And one thing I wanted to note is that in this case, as you can see, the trace of Frobenius is not enough to determine whether the Abelian variety is ordinary or not, unlike the elliptic curve case, right? You actually need to know, like, if you want to know the Newton polygon, right? You really need to know the, um, the eigen, uh, the, the, all the valuations of all the eigenvalues, really. Okay. So what, what, what do we expect? What answer do we expect from this question? Well, it is a conjecture that was raised by Sarah saying that for any Abelian variety A of dimension G over a number field L, the density of ordinary primes should always be positive. Okay, this is completely general. It's any Abelian variety over any number field. And so that's why we say that the ordinary prime, um, the set of ordinary primes, the density is just positive instead of saying it's density one, right? So. If you think about the curve case, right? As I said, for the CM curve, you may have a uh, density one half, but the density being positive should be uh, should be what, what, what we should expect always. So what, what do we know about this conjecture? So first of all, Katz showed that this conjecture holds for, for Abelian surfaces. And then later on, Will Sutton was able to explicitly analyze the density of the ordinary primes. So it's a, the set of ordinary primes has density one or one half or or one quarter, and the one half and one quarter case also comes from Abelian surface with actual endomorphism, just like the uh, similar to the CMDP curve case. And then there are other more other results in this topic, and I just pick some examples. So one example is that Pink showed that 
this conjecture holds for certain abelian varieties A with trivial endomorphism, but a particularly small monophotate group. By small, I really mean it's not a generic monophotate group. And then also very recently, uh, Fete proved that, um, uh, for also proved this conjecture for, a, for families of abelian varieties whose endomorphism, now the endomorphism is not trivial anymore, the endomorphism will contain some imaginary quadratic field, and then there are some other conditions for, for A to satisfy. In this case, he was also able to show that the set of ordinary primes uh, has positive density. Okay. Okay, so now I'm ready to tell you our work. So joined with Kantaro Fafan, Mantoven, Pris, and Tang, this is our current work, ongoing work, which hopefully will finish soon. Um, we were able to show that if, well, this case is definitely finished. It's just we are trying to see how much, how generalized our result can go. Okay, so for curve C, um, with the current, with the following defining equation, y to the fifth equals x times x minus one times x minus t, defined over a number field L, um, Let's consider generic case, which is when the Jacobian of C does not have CM. By CM, I really mean, so this curve is a genus four. This is a genus four curve, as I said. So it's Abelian, a Jacobian is a Abelian fourfold. By CM here, I really mean it does not have CM by a CM field of degree eight, a big CM. Okay, if I, if I consider that case, then um, the set of ordinary primes, for uh, the set of ordinary primes has a positive density. Okay, and if I base change, to L join the, the fifth root unity, or if fifth root unity is already in your base field L, then the, this density will be one. Okay, so this is so this is the case for, for this particular family we are starting. So I want to make a comment that note that in this, so uh, uh, for a curve this, in this family, right? Over, over, um, over L join theta five or over Q join theta five. Uh, so what happens is this curve has an automorphism very concretely by mapping x, y to x comma zeta phi y, right? Because one way you can view this curve is over, uh, over the field L join zeta five, this is a degree five cyclic cover of P1. And there is this cyclic cover, this, this degree five uh, cyclic group acting on the curve, right? We will model the out P1. Okay, so then this automorphism induces a endomorphism of the Jacobian. And in particular, when the, uh, when the Jacobian does not have CM really, uh, or for generic member of this family of the Abelian varieties, the endomorphism exactly is Q adjoint to five. And our work, uh, and we expect our result to be for Abelian varieties with, um, with this essentially roughly this type of endomorphisms. So for example, um, one case we, we currently know how to do is, is that if the endomorphism is just like this case, equals to a CM field of degree D, which in this case, because this is the degree four CM field, and with signature n minus one y at one place and definite at other places. So this is, uh, so I just want to say that our, our general result will be for abelian varieties with certain types of endomorphism, okay? And, um, and another comment I want to make is that, as I said, I'm, this theorem is about a generic member of my family, meaning that the Jacobian does not have complex multiplication. But of course, when, the, when Jacobian does have complex multiplication, we can also very explicitly compute the set of ordinary primes using the Shimura Tanyama formula, just like the curve case, and give a complete answer like the curve case. Okay, so really, the non CM case is the more difficult and more interesting cases, and also generic case. Okay, so then. Let me tell you a little bit about the Newton polygon of this family, and also the yeah, and and why why this is a family that we chose to study. Okay, so if we consider the family of Jacobians for curves over Q bar defined by this defining equation, right? Then, um, then at any at a prime that is not equal to five, then the reduction is a is a um. So uh, then, then, then the reduction is a building fourfold corresponding to a point in, in, the, in, in A4 FP bar. So note that, so, uh, so I, have a, I have a genus four curve. Of course, Jacobian is a principal polarized Abelian fourfold, right? And if I look at all the possible Newton polygons with T equals to four, you, you, can, you can draw them yourself. And there are, there are eight possible Newton polygons. So there are eight Newton stratas, okay? This is, this is why in general, Starting the Newton strata of um, of Abelian fourfold is difficult because there are so many of them. 
but the, but this is not any abelian variety, right? As I said, the this abelian variety admit an endomorphism of Q adjoint zeta five. So because of the actual endomorphism, actually, when you look at the toroidal image of 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 this family of curves, so it really like its image it lies in a PL type Shimura sub variety of A four, um, and this sub variety S actually is is one dimensional. This is really just a Shimura curve. Looks very similar to a to the modular curve, like the curve case. Okay, so the modular of this family looks very similar to the curve, and it is a yeah. Um, so this this follows the work of the Limosto and Monin. Um, and then following the work of Robert Pot, Cotwitz, Richard, or um, Wedholman, Wehman, we know that the Newton strata for for unitary Shimura variety. So in this case, that as I said, our S looks like very similar to J J line, right? And it turns out that for any prime p that is not five, if I consider S by p bar, again just like the modular curve case, it has two Newton stratas. One of them is open and dense, which we will call mu ordinary. So you can think it as a similarly to the ordinary locus in the J line of the D curve over P bar. And then there is a closed locus with finitely many points, which we will call it the basic locus. Um, again, it looks very similar to the super singular locus for the J line D curve. But note that even though this picture, this picture I'm drawing does not depend on P, Okay, for any p, you have two locus. One of them is one of them is open dense mu ordinary. One of them is finitely many points basic for any p. But when you change p, the corresponding Newton polygon may change, even though there are all two locuses. But what Newton polygon each locus corresponds, or more concretely, what's the p-adic valuation of the Frobenius eigenvalues are for these two locuses will change, and it exactly depends on the congruence condition mod five, okay? So when P is one mod five, the mu ordinary polygon is, is ordinary and the basic polygon has P rank two. And when P is two, three or four mod five, then what happens is the mu ordinary polygon is not ordinary anymore. Uh, and the basic polygon has, uh, has P rank zero. It is super singular in the, actually, and in this, in, this, in this case. Okay, so I just want to emphasize that even though for any P, the pictures are the same, but the what Newton polygon these points correspond will be different. Okay, so now after analyzing the moduli, also as I said, like so, if you are starting a general abelian fourfold, there are eight possible Newton strata, right? But then now in this case, I know that actually my abelian fourfold, when I reduce at each fixed p, there are only two possibilities. Okay, so this makes the problem slightly easier starting. Okay. So now let me tell you the general strategy, um, not only for, for, for our project, it's just a general strategy on how to, how to, how to do these problems, like how to study the density of ordinary primes and generalize Sarah's work, Sarah's work. Okay. Well, so first of all, let's talk about a observation. This is a very simple observation. If, since we are only considering the density of primes, right? When I count primes by norm, or I can say other split primes, when I, when I say other primes, um, whose residue field are prime. So this means that if I think about reduction and I want to start the density, all, all I need to think about is um, are the split primes, meaning that locally or at the reduction, all I need to think about are the abelian varieties defined over a prime field, okay, which is a simple observation but helps. Because, okay, so now let's think about the elliptic curve. If I, now let's think about at, at what primes P, my elliptic curve admits all reduction. So as we already discussed that, if my elliptic curve is defined over a prime field, it is ordinary if and only if, if and only if my trace of Frobenius is not zero, okay? So because coming from the coming from the Hasser bond and the fact that my prime, my base field is prime, okay? So this means that this trace of Frobenius A, okay, is a invariant of Frobenius such that first of all, it asserts whether the curve is ordinary or not. Okay, I have one invariant that tells me whether my elliptic curve is ordinary or not. And second of all, when it's not ordinary, it takes a finitely many integral values. And these integral values are independent of P. So exactly A equals, in this case, is exactly A equals to zero, okay? So when the, I have a invariant 
that tells me whether E is ordinary or not. And in, in particular, when it's not ordinary, it takes the value zero. Whichever P it is, it takes the value zero. Okay, the integral value that is independent P. And then the same thing happens for Abelian surface. Okay, so if you look at the characteristic polynomial for Abelian's for Abelian surface, as I said, it's symmetric over P, right? It's symmetric. And it is ordinary if and only if my middle coefficient, if you think about this polygon, is if and only if my middle coefficient is a periodic unit. Okay, it's ordinary if P does not divide A2. Well, then again, if you use Hasselbaum, bond, you see that A2 is bounded by six, six times P, which means that if P is not ordinary, I can start with the invariant A2 divided by P, okay? If it's not ordinary, then this invariant A2 my over P has to be in this set of finite integral values that is independent of P, okay? So for Abelian surface, there is also this very natural natural invariant, okay, which is A2 over P, that also asserts when your Abelian surface is ordinary and also takes finitely many integral values for non-ordinary Abelian surfaces that's independent of P, okay. So this is the first step for doing this kind of problem is you want, you want such invariant, okay. Because then this invariant really gives you a function now on the l adic monotomy group, um, such that the density of ordinary primes is bounded below by the ratio of the connected components of the adic monotomy group on which this function is non-constant because, because this function turns out that in Wilson's proof, this function actually is only constant when, um, when your value is integral. Okay, so by chapter of density, so this will already, this will give you a, um, this will give you that there are, there are positive density set of primes which you have order reduction, as long as you could prove that there is at least one kinetic component where your function takes a non-constant value, okay? So the first, the, 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 the takeaway is the first step is to find one such invariant for the Abelian variety you want to start with, okay? Then the second step is, as I said, is now you need to, you need to start it um, on the l adic monodromy group, what values does my invariant take? Well, so, which means you need to start the connect components, also start the connect components of adic monotomy. So for the little curve case, this follows from Sayer's open image theorem. And then in the, in the Abelian surface case, Sawin, that he was able to explicitly compute the ratio relies on the work of, um, of Fete, Kalaya, Roger, Sutherland on the computation of subtle groups for Abelian surfaces. Okay, so this information allowed them to explicitly compute the um, the density of ordinary primes for EDP curves and Abelian surfaces. Okay, so for our case, um, because of this Q adjoint data five action, so the, sorry, this, this data five action. So we were also able to define functions on Frobenius based on, uh, based on its, its image in Galois and the, uh, based on whether which congruence class of mod five the prime has. And then the value of these functions also exactly have the properties that we want. It observes when my, when my uh, abelian variety has mu order reduction. And also uh, when it's not mu order, it takes a in bounded integral value that's independent of P. And also then the second step, we use the fact that, um, we use the fact that we know uh, over which field the l monotomy group is connected and the Vasil's work on the Montfort Tate conjecture for our case. So really, in our case, roughly the l monotomy group is not that different from the unitary for the for uh, for the fam for the for the Shimura curve we have. So this is why we're able to conclude really that so our actual result will be that the set of mu ordinary primes for any for any Jacobi in this family has density one. Okay. So then you recall that we said ordinary prime has positive density. Well, because as, as I already told you that when P is one mod five, the mu ordinary locus is ordinary, right? So this means that if my mu ordinary has density one, then as a positive density, I am ordinary. And on, on, moreover, if I count prime by norm, that if my base field contains data five, then all I can see are the primes whose characteristics are one mod five. So this is why, it, when the when zeta five is in your base field, the density of ordinary prime becomes one. Okay, 
So this is how you show that there is a positive density of primes that bears ordinary or mu ordinary reduction for a binary variety that you are studying. Okay, so then the next, let's recall Alki's work, starting the super singular, there's a complementary set, set, right? Okay, so I'll recall that Alki shows that if you have any elliptic curve E defined over Q, or, or more generally a large set of number of fields, there exists infinitely many primes at which the reduction is super singular. And then there are some analogous results for abelian surfaces with quaternion multiplication um, uh, obtained by Diao, Sadkov, and uh, Baba Guanans. And so these are all abelian surfaces case. And, in, uh, and now I want to talk about our family of curves, uh, our family of Jacobians. These are again abelian fourfold. Okay. So, but instead of working on any of them, now we need more conditions. Okay, so let's take C um, to be a smooth product curve with a defining equation y to the five equals to x times x minus one times x minus t, okay? Then I'm going to define a rational function called a j um, that is a rational function in key. And I ask this j value to be in q and it is between zero over and 27 over four. I will explain, I will explain what this, uh, these conditions mean in the next slide. And this, so you can think of this as a condition on the Archimedean place for, for my family, uh, for my curve. And then at the prime five, I also have a special condition. I ask a reduction of C at five to be singular, to be a bad reduction. So again, note that this is a family of genus four curve. And my singular fiber actually looks like the intersection of two genus two curves at intersect as a node. So this is what my singular fiber looks like. Okay, I want a reduction of C at five to look like this singular fiber. Okay, if these two conditions are satisfied, then we were able to show that there exist infinitely many primes um, where Jacobian C are the most basic reduction. So recall that we have previously, we proved that at a density one set of primes, Jacobian C are the most ordinary reduction, right? So now we are, we are really generalizing our case in the sense that we are proving that a density zero, zero set of primes is infinite. Okay, so let me, let me, next slide, let me first explain to you what these conditions really mean, okay? So, well, when I have this family of curves, some of you may already start to think that this defining equation looks very similar to the Legendre equation for the curve, where you have y squared equals to x times x minus one times x minus lambda, where, I can parametrize my degree curve by lambda, right? But on the other hand, we also know that the information of lambda really gives you a two torsion point of a degree curve. So lambda is not just parametrizing the isomorphism class of the curve, it has the actual level structure. So same thing happens here for T. Of course, I can parametrize my curve by varying T, but then by varying T is not a one-to-one -one correspondence to the isomorphism classes of the curve in my family. So, then just like the lambda to j map, which is a six to one map, I can just model out this ambiguity coming from t just by defining uh, what we call the generalized j function, which is this degree six uh, rational function in terms of t, then just, just the same way as the correspondence between lambda and j, this is even the same function because you are modeling out with the six, uh, the six possible lambdas or possible t's corresponding to a j, okay? So then this j will uniquely determine the isomorphism class over Q bar and FP bar for my curve or for its Jacob Jacobian for any P that is not equal to five. So, so J is a parameter for the course moduli space S, which we already, we already um, showed up in the, previous, um, in the previous slides of the family. And from this, this parameter, we actually obtain a Q model for the, for the Shimura curve, even though that's the reflex field for the Shimura curve is Q adjoint data five. Okay, but it actually has a Q model, which is actually very important, crucial for our work. So in the theorem, when we ask this generalized J value to be in Q, it means that the field of moduli C is Q. So you can, that's why you can think of it as we are really generalizing LK theorem for AP curve defined over Q. Okay, so, and then, well, what happens for five? Okay, apart, away from any prime, um, away from the prime five, the Shimura curve S has good reduction. And we've also already discussed that um, in this case, if I consider S over P bar, then there are two Newton stratas. One of them is new order and one of them is basic. 
but as the prime five, um, S has bad reduction. And the, there is only one Newton locus there, and it is super singular. Meaning that if you take any abelian variety in my family and reduce mod five, it will be super singular. And this is essentially why we will need to impose the condition at five. I ask my C to be a bad reduction at five. Um, so um, the, 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 the condition of bad reduction can be replaced by some other condition. But in our proof, because of this fact at five, we will need some condition at five for our C, which we all explain in the proof why we will need some condition. But, I, but here I can tell you that the reason we need a condition at five is exactly because the moduli, the Shimura curve, has a bad reduction at five. Okay, so one thing I really like about this project is that I give you one abelian variety, right? I, I hand you one abelian variety defined over a number of fields. And I want to start this reduction at different primes. And it turns out that instead of starting this one abelian variety, I, I'm really, I need to know which family this abelian variety behaves. And then I need to know properties of the moduli space that this abelian, that parametrize the family where this abelian variety is. It's like this abelian variety, even though it's just one single abelian variety, it remembers which family it belongs. Okay, so and this is the perspective you need to take. Okay, so now I have explained to you what it means for J to be in Q and and uh, essentially where why we would need a condition of five. Let me explain the weird the weird interval zero and twenty seven or four where that comes from. Well, to do that we need to think about the. Let me tell you a little bit again more about the family where the abelian variety belongs. Let's think about the complex points of the Shimura curve. So this uh, S over C is a compact Shimura curve, as I said, with reflex field Q to the five. Moreover, it it is a it is a triangle modular curve for the triangle group delta um, two, three, ten. Okay, so it looks very similar to the to the modular curve where the, uh, we know that the modular curve x one is um, h at the upper half plane mod s l two z. Right here, our curve over c is given by upper half plane modulo the, this triangle group. Then the fundamental domain of my s is two copies of a hyperbolic triangle, which I draw here. So, uh, so because our S is really just a P1, right? It's parameterized by J, this one function. So it's a P1. And you can think that you take two triangles a same, that, that look the same and glue them together along the sides. This gives you a sphere, which is a complex P1, right? Okay, so what does the fundamental triangle look like? Well, the fundamental triangle, it has three vertices. Each, each corresponds to a curve or a abelian variety in my family with extra automorphism, okay? So the vertex P, Correspond to a degenerate curve, as I said, it is two copies of a genus two curve. But note that my Shimura curve is actually compact. Okay, so because the generalized coping for this genus for for this curve is still abelian fourfold, so uh, my so so this is not a cusp. I want to emphasize this is not a cusp. Okay, even though the curve it corresponds is singular, but the abelian variety is is, is a good reduction. It's good. Okay. So um, it corresponds to actually like smooth abelian variety, not a semi abelian variety. Okay, so um, so the point is because it's two copies of genus two curve, extra, I have extra automorphism coming from it. I can take automorphism of one copy and fix the other copy so that other smooth curves don't have this automorphism. And then there's a point Q with a extra automorphism of order three with J value zero. And then there's another point R with extra automorphism of order two with J value 27 over four. So you can think of this as very similar to the Lizzie curves with CM by, um, by Q adjoint I and the Q adjoint has three, okay? Okay, so then when I ask the J value for my curve I study to be between zero and 27 over four, means that I'm asking my curve, the moduli point to be on this side, on between this Q and R, okay? So the sides of these triangles actually are the real points of my Shimura curve. And, and these are geodesics in the upper half plane. Okay, so this condition just restricts our modular point to be on the side QR. And the reason here is just a technical reason. It's just in our current work, we know much better, we know more information about the, this geodesic, this side, uh, than the other two. So we, will, we, will, we hope to work um, to get rid of this, this, uh, this restriction. This is just our current current uh, restriction from our proof. Okay, so this is how I explain the, 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 um, 
the theorem. Let me tell you a little bit about the strategy of the proof. Again, let's think about the strategy of Elke's proof. And because when you when you when we ignore all the details, roughly that's the same strategy, just like the case for the ordinary, right? It's the same strategy always. So the proof for this for this theorem is is like the proof um, of there exist infinitely many primes, right? How do you prove there are infinitely many primes? Well, I assume there's a finite set of primes, and then I construct a new one. Okay, so it's similar here. So the point is. Another, another way to visualize it, I always think it as like a fishing game where there's an ocean of primes and I'm building some fishing nets to catch some primes with a special property, okay? Okay, so well, what's the property do I want? is exactly the property that my fixed LP curve, this is my fixed E I want to start with. Mod P is in the super singular locus of my modular curve. Okay, so what are my fishing nets? Well, my fishing nets will be CM curves. The reason is the following. The reason is that I won't start it where E has super single reduction, right? Let me start with some of the curves where I know exactly where they have super single reduction. And those are the CM ones. As I explained, the CM ones, whether they have ordinary super single reduction, comes from a Legendre symbol condition that we discussed before, right? Okay, so think that I now I build some fishing nets, which are CM curves. And what are the primes that will catch me? Well, it exactly catches a prime where. E and this super singular, uh, sorry, this CM EI are uh, isomorphic mod this P. So this exactly when they intersect with the arithmetic intersection, right? So, so every CM curve will catch me some primes by intersecting my E, okay? So, okay, so I want, I want to catch infinitely many primes where I have super single reduction for E. This means that I want the primes I catch to be of super singular type. So what do I need to do? Well, I need to guarantee that each fishing net will intersect a super singular locus, um, now empty. Okay, every time I, every, like, so that this, this fishing net is actually doing something, right? But on the other hand, I want to catch infinitely many, right? This means I need to make sure I have this infinite, infinite set of super singular prime, a CMT curve. I need to make sure they don't intersect at the same inter super singular point. What I do is, as I said, I assume, um, there's the, a the finite set. I just need to make sure that the next one, I'm oh, sorry. I just need to make sure that the next one, um, the, ne the next one will not intersect the same super singular prime as the previous one, right? Then, then I'm done because I have infinitely many. Each, will, each one will catch me at least one super singular prime. And, and the ones that are being caught by this net is, is not the ones that have already been caught, right? Okay, uh, this is the general strategy. And this is also a general strategy for our work, which I don't have time to discuss. So in the last minute, let me explain one thing, which is the condition at five, right? So the point there is how do I guarantee the new fishing net will not catch me a previous prime? Well, um, the, the easiest way is I want to say that for, the, all the, for all the primes that I already know of super single reduction, I can construct a CMT curve which has all the reduction at all the known primes so that I can guarantee the new one I get is, is, is actually new, right? So this would work for any prime that is not at five. Because remember, for all the abelian varieties in my family, they all have super reduction at five. So I can't, I can't use the Newton strata to guarantee that the CM curve I construct does not intersect my original curve at five. So I need to some, use some other discrete invariant to tell me, to guarantee that even though I have infinitely many fishing nets, they are not just all catching five repeatedly, right? So the current condition we impose is smooth versus singular, but um, we will also work on trying to, to, to use other discrete conditions instead of that one to be able to generalize, uh, to make our theorem more general. But this is behind why we need a condition at five. So I'm running out of time, so I don't have time to tell you the schedule of proof. So let me just finish there and uh, thanks for your attention.